Then she joined uh, Waterloo as an assistant professor, an associate professor, and full professor now. And she is actually the 2010 winner of the CRM SSC prize, a award considered as the highest honor for young Canadian statisticians. And she also received the prestigious university faculty awards granted by the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And today, Grace is going to talk about the causal inference with binary outcomes subject to both missingness and the misclassification. Okay, let's welcome Grace to speak. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Andrew. So, yeah, just a quick uh, update of my affiliation. Uh, last year, I joined the uh, University of Western Ontario, so now I left uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, and this is a uh, joint work with my former PhD student, Di Su, who was uh, doing her program at Waterloo. So I'm going to talk about uh, um, missingness and measurement error related to uh, the data, uh, if we are interested in causal inference. So now I need, okay. So I'm going to first start with uh, some motivating example. So if we look at uh, this particular data related to smoking cessation interventions, uh, in Li and Oz's uh, 2013 paper, they are interested in studying the effectiveness of uh, parative smoking cessation programs. So in this study about 168 patients participated and they were randomized to receive either a treatment or a control uh, which uh, in which case treatment was defined as uh, receiving um, intensive smoking sensation intervention and the control group just received a uh, standard care and the data includes uh, two types of variables and uh, we are interested in the so-called outcome, which indicates the smoking cessation standards of patient for the previous seven days during a 30 days uh, follow-up period. And baseline covariates include a number of variables such as gender, age, body mass index, diabetes, standards, hypertension, et cetera. And we are particularly interested in understanding if the smoking intervention has causal effect or no effect. So in this case, the interesting quantity is denoted by this notation tau zero, which indicates the average treatment effect. So here the expectation of Y1 and expectation of Y0 would be used to uh, characterize the average of potential outcome if a subject would have been observed um, if we uh, assign this subject to be in treatment group. Otherwise, Y0 represents a potential outcome that would have been observed and the subject being uh, assigned to a control group. And it turned out in this particular uh, scenario, average treatment effect tau zero cannot be obtained directly based on the available measurements on the observed outcome standards. Because in that case, if we simply use a sample average and take this, we mainly uh, focus on evaluating the uh, estimate of the conditional, uh, the difference of conditional expectation instead of uh, the marginal expectation between Y1 and Y0. And to overcome these potential issues, um, in the literature, there are a number of uh, methods to do this. And one interesting and useful approach is so-called propensity score approach. So in this case, we want to introduce an additional quantity which is related to the probability an individual would be assigned to treatment group given the uh, pre-treatment uh, 
covariates denoted by x. So here this E is essentially represents a, a propensity score O related to so-called the treatment model. And uh, we want to incorporate this effect when we try to use the sample observations. So in this case, I introduce those uh, typical notations, Xi, Yi, and Ti. So Xi represents a confounders of pretreatment covariates for subject in a given sample of size n. Ti is the observed binary treatment indicator, and Yi would represent the uh, observed outcome for individual subject I. And we would be able to modify the sample average by using this propensity score. So if we can estimate propensity score for each subject EI, so here notationally we use EI hat to indicate this quantity, then we just uh, use the inverse weight to uh, adjust our sample average, then we would be able to consistent estimate uh, consistent estimate the uh, average treatment effect and also obtain its asymptotic distributions. And this is a standard approach, but it turned out we need two key assumptions. We require the um, observed outcome yi must be precisely measured and be observed. But it turned out in this a motivating example, there are two typical challenges. We have a missing observations. About 10% of subjects have missing outcome information. And for those subjects with complete uh, outcome observations, about 7.5% subjects would misreport their outcome standards. So to feature those two challenges, we introduced two additional notations, ri and yi star. Ri represents a missing data indicator, and Yi star represents the reported outcome variables, which could be different from the Yi uh, here. And uh, in order to conduct the following development, we make some standard notations related to missing this process and the measurement error process. So the first assumption essentially says um, missing indicator only be driven by the covariates and treatment information, and it won't be related to uh, the observed outcome. So this is sort of related to missing and random mechanisms. And regarding misclassification process, we assume if we can observe the true value y, then the covariates and treatment of missing data indicator would be in dependent of surrogate measurements Y star. And in the following development, development, I'm going to use pi and PAB to represent these associated probabilities for meanness and the measurement error. Now the next question is, what would be the effects of meanness and measurement error? And naturally, you could try to use our conventional way to measure or to estimate uh, average treatment effect. So depending on our expertise, we might uh, be able to think of three approaches, which are called naive. Naive approach in this sense is I'm going to ignore some features, either missingness or misclassification, or even both. If I'm going to uh, ignore both features, I'm going to use notation tau hand double star. And if I ignore uh, missingness but incorporate the misclassification effect, I'm going to net um, tau hand uh, star to represent. Otherwise, ignoring misclassification effect but accommodate missingness effect, I'm going to use tau tilde star to represent. So, natural question is: Are these three naive estimators would be still consistent to estimate tau zero? Do we need to introduce any adjustment for the induced effects? If we have to, how would we be able to do that? So our objectives here basically is first investigate the impact of misclassification and missingness. And second, we want to develop valid adjustment approaches. So regarding the first questions, we are able to establish the relationship 
among those three estimators, in a sense, how to characterize their induced bias. So it turned out if the bias for the naive estimators, uh, tau hand double star, which ignores both missingness and mission pair, can be expressed in terms of uh, bias of naive estimators which ignores one feature alone. And also you could notice P11, P10, which are related to misclassification probabilities, would come into the play as well. If we look at this expression in terms of the absolute value of bias, so it turned out we would have these inequalities. So what would be the implement, uh, implications here? So practically speaking, that means we would be able to uh, encounter these counterintuitive situations, which means if I'm going to simultaneously ignore both missingness and measurement effects, then this resulting naive estimators could be even better than if we ignore a single feature. So this is somewhat a surprising uh, finding here. Then next, how would we accommodate missingness and misclassification effects in order to develop valid inference if I want to estimate uh, average treatment effect tau zero. So we came up with uh, several approaches. So uh, I just use this summary, uh, this theorem to summarize the resulting approaches. So it turned out if we are going to do uh, modifications on my previous uh, estimators based on the context, the ideal context without measurement error or without misclassifications, then in that case, I won't only need to use the propensity score EI hat to sort of adjust the sample average. I am able to get a consistent estimator. But with missingness and measurement errors, we are going to incorporate their effects by adjusting the weight. So one uh, pro, uh, so you can notice those blue entries represent the incorporation of missingness effects indicated by missing indicator RI and the associated probabilities. And also, since we are not able to observe YI, the true observed value, true observed outcome value for each subject, we only have a surrogate YI star. Then to adjust the potential difference between Y star and YI, we also incorporate the associated misclassification probabilities. And different from the standard case, we also have an additional term indicated by this red uh, fractions, which is related to uh, the degree of misclassifications. So we would use a similar ways to estimate expected value for potential outcome Y1 or potential outcome Y0. And another approach is we can use the same structures to do adjustment, but we further incorporate the number of subjects in the samples who are assigned in treatment or controlled groups. So in that case, we would also be able to manipulate this factor one over n. Instead of using the entire sample size, we can incorporate the missingness in this uh, samples by replacing one over n with those blue entries. So it turned out either approach will give us consistent estimators for the uh, average treatment effect tau zero. Now, I want to make a quick comment on these formulations. First, you could notice in these formulations, we only need to introduce a propensity score estimation EI and the missingness probability pi i and the misclassification probabilities. We don't have to model the outcome uh, variables at all. And also in these uh, formulations, we assume propensity scores would EI would be consistently estimated. Now, a natural question is, what if a propensity score is subject to these specifications? So it means if my treatment model is misspecified, can I have some remedies to overcome these um, issues? 
So our next part is try to come up with so-called doubly robust estimators. So our objective here is try to uh, use some additional information or knowledge about outcome models to compensate the potential risk if my treatment model about propensity score EI is misspecified. So in this setup here, we are going to modify the previous uh, quantities in terms of using this Q1 uh, hat and Q0 hat, which represents the information related to our outcome variables. And in the meantime, we also introduce the uh, dependence on propensity scores here. Then we could construct this new estimator denoted by tau hat dr. And this is a doubly robust estimator for average treatment effect uh, tau zero in a sense. If my treatment model is misspecified, but my outcome variables, outcome model is correctly specified. Or in other work, in other situation is my treatment model is correctly specified, but the outcome, outcome models is misspecified. So we are now one of these two models could be misspecified. Then we are still able to have a uh, consistent estimators tau zero here. Now to give you, a, then I skip a lot of technical details in terms of uh, developing asymptotic uh, distributions for those uh, estimators. Now I just want to give you a quick idea about how those different approaches may perform numerically. So I just apply those approaches to our initial motivating examples. In this case, we um, conduct a so-called sensitivity analysis by considering different degrees of uh, uh, misclassification probabilities indicated by 5, 7.5, 10, and 15%. And comparing with those results, we can see if we simply ignore misclassification effects, then the resulting naive estimators will give us the smallest estimate. And if we ignore both misclassification and missingness effects, then the resulting estimates would be the second smallest. And you could also notice the estimates for tau zero would be sensitive to different degrees of uh, misclassifications. And uh, for the doubly robust estimators tau hat dr, it will give us the largest S point estimates and the largest standard errors. So in terms of the largest standard errors, this is not really surprising in a sense that is a price we have to pay if you want to gain um, uh, protection of potential model misspecification uh, risk. And uh, we could also notice all those approaches reveal the same type of evidence that there is significant causal effect of intervention on smoking cessation. So I have one minute left, I think. I'm going to wrap up this talk by uh, providing a general discussion here. So in this talk, I particularly focus on so-called noisy data. In a sense, our data could involve measurement there or even missing observations. And this kind of data is quite common in applications. And it turned out the research on either feature, either missing data or measurement errors have been very active. For example, like uh, Rodolito uh, just mentioned like yesterday's talk, he has uh, like uh, three editions of the book. And in terms of uh, measurement error, uh, errors, there are a number of uh, books as well. And of course, here just use this opportunity to advertise my own book here. But the question is, it seems in the literature not too many uh, papers or not too much work have been available to look at both missing observations and measurement error features in the data. And from these uh, simple scenarios in causal inference, then we could notice the induced impact from both features could be a lot more complicated then the effects that would be induced from considering a single features. 
because these two features could interact or interplay in complicated ways. And sometimes we may end up with uh, counterintuitive scenarios that ignoring both features could be even better than ignoring one feature. So this is a very interesting uh, message. And also, if we want to develop valid inference approaches, normally you may notice additional modeling for each process would be required. And when we introduce this additional modeling for Lucent's process, that would definitely arch our research scope. And in the meantime, it will generate new issues. For example, uh, non-identifiability would be a typical concern when you have uh, more additional modelings because your parameter space can be actually enlarged. And in this case, uh, other issues such as modeling assumptions and mechanisms would be uh, a typical concern. So then how would we be able to reach uh, balance about simplicity general uh, narratives? And in the meantime, usually those additional modelings cannot be really tested. So I think I have to stop here. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Grace. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, actually, I have a question. Uh, okay. This, this, this is a really nice method, um, focusing on the average treatment effect estimation and uh, with the double robustness estimator proposed. So I was curious, is it possible to apply the nice idea to other problems in causal inference, uh, such as say instrumental variable effect, I would say intermediate, uh, just other problems in causal inference. Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, we could. Yeah, if we have, so in this case, I didn't really consider any additional available data such as uh, validation or instrumental variables. So that's why in my final data analysis, I just focus on like uh, sensitivity analysis by assuming a given uh, misclassification probabilities. If we have additional data, definitely, uh, then we would have a more flexible cases in a case, in in a sense, we would be able to estimate those misclassification probabilities. Yes, thank you. Thank you.